Yes, great is thy faithfulness. He provides everything, doesn't he? Good morning. Good afternoon, actually. Good afternoon, loved ones. Grace, peace, and love from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What a privilege it is to be able to come together and worship as a church family should. Today we're going to explore another one of Jesus' parables in Matthew 21. Now, a parable, as you know, is a concise, instructive story that illustrates one or more edifying lessons or principles intended to teach a moral or spiritual lesson. So let's turn to, in God's holy word, to Matthew 21, and we'll read this together. Matthew 21, verse 33 through 41, and I'm reading from the ESV today. Verse 33, here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another and stoned another. And again, he sent another other servants more than the first time and they did the same things to them finally he sent his son to them saying they will respect my son but the tenants saw the son and they said to themselves this is the heir come let us kill him and have his inheritance and they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him when therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. This is the second parable that is aimed at the religious leaders of Israel. If we remember last week, the parable of the two sons, Jesus identified the religious leaders of Israel with the son who said that he would do what he was told to do, but never did. Jesus then identified the tax collectors and the prostitutes with the son who said they wouldn't at first, but did later. Now he goes on in verse 33 and says to them, hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press, built a tower, leased it to the tenants, and went off to another country. The details here are full of meaning. The landowner is God. The vineyard is God's people, or in this case, Israel. The vine growers, or the tenants, would be the religious leaders of Israel. In verse 34 through 36, the servants are sent to collect the rent. Those would be the prophets. Then in 37 through 39, the son is finally sent, and that would be Jesus. By the way, this is the first time that Jesus has publicly identified himself as the son of God. As a background to the parable, there was anger felt throughout Palestine because of foreign absentee landowners. Much of the land was owned by wealthy foreigners. There was resentment against them on the part of the tenants that would, were like sharecroppers or tenant farmers who actually worked the land for these rich foreign absentee landowners. Of those listening to Jesus, there would be a lot of sympathy for the vine workers. However, at the end of the parable, Jesus reverses the outcome on them, and they realize that they are condemning themselves. Only at the end do they come to realize that Jesus is attacking them. God provided everything for them and also for us. Jesus highlights the privilege that Israel took for granted, the responsibility that they had as his people to bear fruit for God. Then the consequence of their failure to succeed as a privileged possession of God. The vineyard is Israel, like I said, and Israel, that 
is protected and provided for. It is, it is Israel that God protected. The landowner was God. God planted the vineyard and took what else he did, and look what else he did for Israel. He put a fence around it that prevents marauders. It keeps people out from stealing or destroying the vineyard. It keeps animals from getting into the vineyard and consuming it. He built a tower in the vineyard, an observation tower, from which one might get a warning of possible attackers or animals approaching, or fire, or some other kind of danger. He also dug a wine press. A wine press would typically be dug into the rock. This would consist of two vats. One would be lower than the other. The upper vat would be where they put the grapes and stomp on them and crush them. They would put a channel between the two vats and the juice would flow from the upper to the lower vat where it would begin the process of fermentation. So this was a well-equipped and well-provided for and well-protected vineyard. Jesus here is giving us a picture that God has provided for his people. He has protected them. He has equipped them adequately for what he has designed them to do. Amos the prophet in his third chapter, verse 2, records God's word to Israel. You only have I known from all the families of the earth. That's their privileged position. You only have I called. Paul the Apostle in Romans 9, 4 through 5, Romans 3, 2, and again in Ephesians 2, 1 through 22, reminds Israel that they are the adopted sons. To them was given the law of God. To them was given the temple and its services. To them, God promised to give the Messiah. The point of the parable, and Amos, and Paul, was that Israel was a very privileged and well provided for people that was enriched by God himself. The consul, the religious leaders of Israel, are now reduced to pupils. They have been listening to teaching and not teaching others. They have been made to answer questions and not asking them. This is why Jesus said, Hear another. Listen to this, you rejectors of John, of John the Baptist. Punish, punishment surely awaits you. Tax collectors and prostitutes shall go into the kingdom before you will. Matthew 21, 31. The council is now being exposed and denounced by our Lord Jesus Christ. They are dried up and hard of heart and exemplify the teaching of that withered fig tree in Matthew 21, 17 through 20. This parable also represents the patience of God. When the master leaves the country, in the parabolic sense, God withdrew for a time. The physical sense of his presence was no longer displayed. God had, been, had a visible presence at Mount Sinai and in the pillar of fire during the Exodus. Though he no longer had an open vision, though they no longer had an open vision of God, they were left with God's written word. In the course of their history, God had urged them to do what was right. The parable ends with the prophecy of the coming events, and is answered by the council themselves. We look at this parable then as partly retrospective, looking backwards, and partly predictive, looking forwards. Jesus has certainly highlighted the fact that Israel is a privileged possession of God, that he so abundantly provided for them. We can see the same message in the terms of the church today. He might say to us today, do you realize that the church is my vineyard? Do you realize how much you have been given? Do you realize what a privilege it is to worship in this place? What a beautiful place it is to worship that you did not build, that you did not pay for, yet you meet here week after week. A place where the gospel is read, a place where the word is preached, a place where the word is sung, a place where the word is prayed, a place where God's saving message is taught every week. Jesus is saying, do not take for granted this privilege that you enjoy. These provisions that God has given you, 
his people. These are things that we should be rejoicing about and that we should be grateful to have. We should give thanks every day of our lives for the abundance that he that we enjoy that we did not earn nor do we deserve. Therefore, we should faithfully respond. And how do we do that? Be fruitful for God's sake. Surely, he has given us everything we need to succeed. Next, Jesus goes on, having highlighted their privileges, he highlights their responsibilities to give the best fruit for God's kingdom. In verse 34, when the season of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. In Luke 12, 48, it says, Everyone to whom much is given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand more. It's a basic biblical principle of the resources that have been given to you, much will be required to, in return. And trust me, people, we have been given much. On the global scale, we are extremely blessed. Compared to the rest of the world, we are very rich. Not only money-wise, but we have the Holy Word, we have a church family, and friends, and health, and education, employment. We live in a democracy. We have understanding, sight, hearing, knowledge, wisdom. Our problems are so very small. Much will be required of us and how we've used those gifts that have been given to us. Now the relationship here is between the master of the house and the tenants, the tenant farmers. See, it was necessary for the master, the landowner, to collect the rents, even if it was a small amount. The reason is that there was a civil law that stated if farmers worked the land for three years without the owner collecting rent, they could claim the land for their own. If three years went by without anyone claiming ownership, they could claim the land for themselves. And how do you establish ownership of the land? Rents. Rents would be collected by the owner. That would prove their ownership. Otherwise, the tenants have something like what we call squatter's rights. They are on the land, they are working the land, and nobody is collecting rent. After three years, the land is theirs. They can lay claim and have title to the land. So the owner is going to have his rent, his fruit. Perhaps we could presume that verse 35 was the first year. He has three years to collect his rent, so he sends his servants to receive his fruit. And look what they did. The tenants took his servants, his prophets, as it were. They beat one, they killed one, and they stoned another. The tenants have decided that they want the land for themselves. They're not going to give up the rent. They treat God's servants like robbers and intruders. They beat them and kill them. God expected fruit from his workers. It was reasonable, and it's expected. And this was agreed upon in Ezekiel 34, 31. And you are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the Lord God. We should note that both ministers and people God looks for fruit accordingly. This is not a hasty demand. He did not demand you to produce fruit before you became a Christian. People seem to think they need to get their act together first before answering God's call. Still, the time of harvest draws near. As John preached in Matthew 3, 2, we must repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We see here what happens to God's faithful servants. Not only were they hated and disgraced, they were treated like worse criminals. It says they beat them, killed them, and stoned them. The nation of Israel beat Jeremiah 
They killed Isaiah. They stoned Zechariah in the temple. Are we seeing the message? We see how this ties together? They resisted paying the master, hoping that perhaps the owner would conclude that it is too difficult to collect. He's too far away, and because of the difficulty, maybe he'll give up and the land will become theirs if he can't collect the rent. However, look at verse 36. It says, he didn't give up. Perhaps we are to understand this is the second year. He sends more servants than the first. The tenants did the same to them. They fought off the claim for a second year. We see in 2 Chronicles 36, 15, and 16, the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion for his people. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at the prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. Also, Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 66, 5, but it is they who shall be put to shame. Nowadays, there are more of God's believers than in earlier times. Each one of us is to carry the gospel message. Live the gospel message. Share the gospel message. Produce fruit for him who has blessed us. Verse 37, finally, he sent his son. They will respect my son, he says. Perhaps we see this as a third year. The third and final year, he must collect his rent. This has, he has been patient and forgiving so far, but it is crucial, so he sends his son. The parable now symbolic, sim, symbolically switches from the past to the future. The story moves from the retrospective mode, looking backwards, to the predictive mode, looking forward. Jesus does this in such a masterful way, concealing its relevance and leading the listeners to pronounce their own condemnation. We'll get to that in a minute. But Christ here shows his deity for the first time in the story. You look at verse 38. But when the servants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. Now, it's absolutely clear what their intentions are. Maybe they think that the title to the land has been given to the son already. Or perhaps they think the appearance of the son means the father is dead. Or better still, if the father is not dead, they kill the son and the father will surely give up. Then the land will become theirs. And they will have title to it. In verse 39, they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. The tenants killed him outside the vineyard. They did not want to pollute the vineyard. The blood would pollute the land. It would be unclean. And no one would buy the produce. This means they were very clear-headed and calculated. This was not a crime of passion in a moment of rage. They calmly thought out their moves. They seized the son, removing him from the vineyard or Israel. They resolved to preserve their wealth and greatness by taking Jesus out of the picture altogether. He was the heir to the throne of God. Pilate and Herod and none of the other rulers of this age understood this, for if they had they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2.8 The council knew he was the Son of God. Therefore, come, let us kill him. They envied and feared him. They hoped to secure their place over the people. They pretended that he must die to save people from the Romans. John 11.50 Really, he must die to save their hypocrisy and tyranny from the reformation which the kingdom of God would have surely brought. Jesus had just drove out the buyers and sellers from the temple. Therefore, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. 
They thought if they could get rid of Jesus, they could have the temple for themselves. Then they could impose their conditions and force the people to do as they pleased. So they took counsel against the Lord and his anointed. And But he that sits on the right hand, he that sits in heaven laughs, and the Lord holds them in derision. While they thought to kill him and seize in his inheritance, he went to the cross by the will of the Father, and they were broken into pieces with a rod of iron. Psalm 2. They had their way, but what they gained was demolished. The leaders of Israel thought they should have control. The equivalent today would be an attempt to run the church, God's holy church, for one's own purposes. To enrich oneself. Not that there's any lack of that happening today. It happens all over the world. False teachers have taken the church by storm. Leaders saying, this is my vineyard. This is my church. And so it's going to suit my ends. It's going to serve my purposes. It's going to assist me in achieving those ends that I want. The leaders have lost sight of the fact that the nation of Israel and the people of God, God's holy church, belongs to God. It's not there for them to plunder. It's not there for them to steal. The church, the people of God, are His. The ones most guilty of robbing God's church are the ministers and the denominational bureaucrats who begin to see the church as their own, their kingdom, their own kingdom, to gather power and excess that power and enhance their own position, to determine to the detriment of the vineyard, to the detriment of the church, to the people of God. What does God want from his church? He wants faithfulness, and he wants proper fruit. Though the Romans ultimately put Christ to death, it was still the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders. They were the principal agents that caused his death. They were so set upon killing him to secure their own rights and rituals and power, they did Satan's work for him. They committed the greater sin. Acts 2, 23 this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Though it was to be, it was the religious leaders that did this. It's ironic, isn't it? The leaders of Israel, the leaders of the temple and God's holy city were the ones responsible for killing God's only son. They cast him out of the vineyard, out of the holy church. They cast him out of the holy city. He was crucified outside the gates. Hebrews 13, 12. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. That's how Jesus crushed Satan. That's how Jesus won. That's, how, that's why his blood sanctifies us. He has shed his own blood for my soul. Now I'd like to go back just for a minute to verse 37 and look at the last half of that verse. See where the master says, they will respect my son. In contrast to the eventual death of Christ, the expectation of they will respect my son was ultimately seen in the conversion of many Jews to Christianity which led to the spreading of the gospel to all nations, to the obedience of faith. See, God gets his fruit one way or another. The church must not lose sight of the purpose for which God has created it and brought it into being. That is something that's easy to do when the church is viewed as some kind of organization designed to meet my needs, to meet my goals. Unfortunately, churches are doing an outstanding job of reinforcing that mentality. They view church congregation as consumers who need to be appeased 
in every way. When the leaders of that kind of church pander to the audiences, they are trying to enhance their own place and position. They are destroying the faithfulness and the fruitfulness. In fact, they are plundering God's holy church just so they may gain notoriety and enhance themselves. The church is meant to be a means by which the world is transformed. It is to be a city set on a hill to be a light shining in the darkness. The vineyard, the church, the people of God are to be transforming people. The world is to be changed as they encounter the church, as they encounter the gospel. Ordinary people becoming new creatures in Christ Jesus. The old passing away, the new becoming new people. All because the fruit is given to the master. That was Israel's leadership's responsibility to lead Israel to that goal. And that is the church's responsibility today. The responsibility of church leaders is to faithfully lead the church to bear fruit. Lastly, we see Jesus highlighting the consequences of failing to fulfill those responsibilities. God's judgment falls on the faithless and fruitless. God asked, Jesus asked them in verse 40, when therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do with those tenants? And they said to him, the leaders, Israel's leaders said to him, he will put those riches to a wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits of their season. You notice Jesus did not argue with them, and for the second time since verse 31, he manages to lead his opponents in such a way that they relieve him of the responsibility of condemning them because they condemned themselves. The council are the ones he's speaking to. The council are the ones who are speaking in verse 41. They don't yet understand the point. They say to Jesus, they, he will put those wretches to a miserable death, not understanding that they're talking about themselves. Jesus goes on to explain in verse 43, Therefore I tell you the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people producing its fruits. In other words, give it to the church of the international community for all people, the Gentiles and the Jews. God was patient with Israel until the tenants killed his son. After that, no more patience could be shown to them. They had rejected the greatest messenger from God. The destruction came 40 years later when Jerusalem fell by Emperor Titus. Doom awaits all false teachers of God's church who repeat the same sin as the Hebrews. It awaits all who work in the midst of God's church without giving any fruits to glorify God. Yes, God is patient, but his patience has its limits. The church needs to understand that. For example, what, what became of that great church of North Africa there used to be a great church in North Africa that was the Church of Augustine and Ambrose. It was one of the leading churches. But in 700 AD, it was overrun by Muslims, and there has been no Christian church in that region, region since, except a small sprinkling of Christians here and there. What happened, you might ask? The glory of God departed. What happened to the great churches of Western Europe? The judgment of God had fallen on them. You can go from one end of Europe to the other and have difficulty finding a church full of people on Sunday. What happened to the many churches of Great Britain? A hundred years ago, if you visited London, you'd be hard-pressed to decide which church to attend. Today, again, mostly empty. What happened? The glory has departed. They failed to produce fruit of the kingdom so the kingdom was taken away from them it was given to those who would would produce fruit the parable certainly warns Israel but it's also warning us the wild branches 
We, the Gentiles, as wild branches, we're the ones grafted into the olive tree of Israel. We are now warned to also bear fruit. This one question is for his children. Are we bearing fruit? By doing so, we glorify God. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be his disciples. John 15, 8. We must not forget God did not spare the natural branches of Israel, neither will he spare the wild branches. God has right to the fruits of his people. His ministers must tend the vineyard faithfully. The Christian must produce fruit. We must grow into mature Christians and spread the gospel. God requires us to work in his vineyard. Let's obey him. Let's be grateful and work to produce fruit that is pleasing to the one who owns us, the one who has brought to you, the one who has bought you with his blood, with the blood of his own son. He wants his fruit. It does require us to work and deny ourselves and produce fruit. Our ambition should be to please him as grateful sons and daughters saved by grace, saved by faith, saved by the blood of Christ, so we must effectively serve him and produce fruits of the kingdom, the fruits of his kingdom, which he will be pleased that one day he may say to us, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come, enter in my rest. I pray that might be the case for each and every one of us. Let's turn to God's holy word in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 25. And we'll read this together and then we'll close. 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 21. For it is you, for this, sorry, for this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself in him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in the, his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this powerful and wonderful story that teaches us so much. Lord, I sincerely pray that everyone in this room truly knows Christ, that they are not just going through the motions. I pray that everyone here understands the true meaning of this story. I pray that we all understand the work we must do daily. O oh, Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that our congregation would be faithful and fruitful. I pray that we would produce eternal fruit for your kingdom, that it would be our great ambition in life so that we would be a part of your kingdom. I ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would move in our hearts today and give us peace and understanding. As always, Lord, we pray for Christians around the world that are being persecuted for your name's sake. Father, give them the strength to persevere, and also give us here today the strength to live our lives for you daily, Lord. In your holy name, Father, amen.